Let us pray. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, O Lord, are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Is there something or someone you'd rather not think about? Is there some issue or situation or difficulty you'd rather avoid or deny? And I'm not talking about the 2024 presidential election. I mean, eight months left. Let's just hold on. We can, we can make it, people. But I wonder, for you personally, is there some fear, some worry, some wound, some frustration that you'd rather just pretend doesn't exist? Like if you just ignore it or forget about it, it will go away. A priest friend of mine who is, shall we say, conflict-averse, uh, once told me that his uh, approach to conflict was to ignore it until it resolved itself or went away. It's a great strategy. Sometimes it works, but sometimes it doesn't. And I will say that when it comes to my own life, there are certainly issues, issues that I'd rather not look at problems and pains that I'd rather ignore or try to forget. Because to look at them, to see them, to even think about facing them uh, creates anxiety and fear and exasperation. And I wonder if you have anything like that in your life. If you do, if you have some obstacle some stumbling block, some presenting issue. What I want to suggest to you this morning is that in the words of one of my uh, mentors, my seminary dean, the obstacle may in fact be the way through. Or to quote the serenity prayer, if you know it, the hardship may actually be the pathway to peace. Or to quote that same conflict-averse priest friend of mine, he likes to say, God's office is at the end of our rope. Now, if I'm not making any sense, which is perfectly uh, probable, allow me to put it a bit more plainly. That place of pain, of fear, that situation you'd rather not face, that problem you're trying to ignore, that thing you'd rather not look at, that may in fact be exactly where God is at work in your life, the place where He's doing something. That may be the place where He will in fact reveal Himself to you, where He will show up and show you that He does in fact care about you and love you. That pain may be the place where God wants to heal you and set you free. Or to put it even more plainly, the place where you think God isn't, where He couldn't possibly be, that might in fact be where He is, where you might find Him. So let me give you a couple examples of this idea. I remember a parishioner of mine once who was an alcoholic pretty bad alcoholic, and it was obvious to everyone, but no one wanted to face with it, face it. No one wanted to deal with it. Everyone just wanted to ignore it. But then it became impossible to ignore, and a few people that loved this man began to discuss possibly doing an intervention. And I remember talking with another friend of mine who was also an alcoholic, but she was in recovery, about how we could do this, about how to best help and serve this poor man, because I was a bit nervous to be honest with you. And I'll never forget what she said, but more importantly, how she looked. She got this huge smile on her face, and she said, RJ, this is so exciting because this is the beginning of this man's life. He has no idea what what joy, what peace uh, are waiting for him on the other side of alcohol. 
And if you're in recovery yourself or you know someone who is, then you, you know that this is true. Right? The alcoholic, while they're using, can't imagine life without alcohol. And very often, no one around them wants to face the problem. They want to forget about it and ignore it. But very often, the, the addiction is the very place where God is at work and where He works miracles, where He brings healing that no one thought was possible, and not just in the life of the addict, but to everyone around them. The hardship actually does become the pathway to peace. Another example. You may find this surprising, but many clergy are what we might term people pleasers. Uh, Clergy, priests, pastors, we really like to be liked a lot. My friend Sarah Condon told me about a, a clergy conference she went to, Sarah, who was here preaching about a month and a half ago, and the speaker at this clergy conference asked who in the room felt as a child as if it was up to them to take care of their mother. She said almost every hand in the room (laughs) went straight up. And I remember talking once to another clergy friend of mine who was worn out. He was exhausted. He was serving at a successful church in earthly terms. The church was vibrant and growing. Things were going well, but he was approaching something like burnout. And what he realized was that his exhaustion was tied to his people-pleasing, to his need to have everyone around him like him all the time. And not just to like him, but to feel like he liked uh, them and was available to them, whatever they might need, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I remember him saying to me, uh, you know, RJ, what I really seem to believe is that if everyone doesn't like me all the time, and if they don't think that I like them, then my church is going to fall apart. What my friend realized was that as much as he said that his church was about God, about Jesus, it was really about him. And even the idea of pulling back a little bit, of caring for himself a little bit more, of not expending so much energy to make sure that everyone liked him all the time, even that idea filled him with such dread (laughs) that he could barely stand to think about it. And yet he knew that was the place that God was working. That was where God was calling him, to rely on God and not himself. So the very thing that my friend feared most, giving up on being liked, that's exactly where God wanted to bring freedom and healing. Turning to the Bible, as we often do here, I don't know if you noticed, but today's story from the book of Numbers is really strange. I know you know it well because you've all read Numbers, of course, right? Fourth book of the Bible, Genesis twice, Messi Ravinelli, committed it to memory. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. It's the story of Israel's wandering in the desert after their liberation from their bondage and slavery in Egypt. And at this point in the story, you know, God has been with them. He's been leading them and speaking to them and providing for their every need. And surprisingly, it's not enough. It's not good enough for the Israelites. So they begin to complain to God and to Moses, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. (laughs) It's a great line. Reminds me of that... uh, story about two friends who go to a restaurant, and one says, the food here is terrible, and the other one says, yes, and such small portions. (laughs) Anyway, the people complain, and God finally is, is fed up. He's had enough, and so He sends these poisonous serpents into their midst to bite them, and a bunch of them die. And then the Israelites repent. They say, we're sorry. And they plead with Moses, would you pray to God to take away these serpents, please? And here's what God tells Moses to do. Make a poisonous serpent, make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. Now, by the way, that's where the symbol for the American Medical Association comes from, from this story. So, 
Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. What a weird story. What a strange thing to tell Moses to do. Because first off, um, remember it was a serpent that got us all into this mess in the first place, right? Remember the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, the serpent comes, eat this fruit and your eyes will be opened and you will be like God and they eat it and they see they're naked and shame and sin and guilt and death enter the world and here we are. A serpent got us into this mess. Second, a bronze serpent feels a little bit like a golden calf, doesn't it? It's so strange. And remember, when Moses went up the mountain to talk with God, and he'd already given the Israelites the Ten Commandments, and the second commandment was, thou shalt have no other gods before me and not fashion any idols. They made a golden calf. They couldn't wait to break the law, and it didn't go well for them. And here, God is saying to Moses, make a bronze serpent that the Israelites might look at it and live. What a strange thing. How, how could God be there? <laughs> And finally, in this story, serpents are the source of the Israelites' pain, the source of their fear, the source of their death, the thing they're trying to avoid, the one thing they don't want to look at, the thing they're running away from. And yet, God says, look at the serpent. Look at your pain, God says, and be healed. Look at your fear and be comforted. Look at your sin, your betrayal, and be forgiven. Look at death and live. Did you hear what Jesus said in today's gospel reading? Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world, this this wonderful verse, God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him may not perish but have eternal life. Now, when Jesus is talking about the Son of Man being lifted up even as the serpent was lifted up, what's He talking about? He's not talking about the ascension. He's not talking about the resurrection. He's talking about the cross. He's talking about His death. And can I just say, the truth is, at least for me, we don't really want to look at the cross, do we? It's hard. It's painful. It's ugly. It's a reminder of everything we would rather avoid, everything we would rather forget, sin and pain and death. How could God be there? could God be in the cross? And yet, what does He say? Look there. Look at the cross. Look at your sin, which put Jesus there, and be forgiven. Look at His pain and be healed. Look at His shame and receive glory. Look at death and receive life. One more short story, and then I'll be done. A friend of mine recently had to make one of the hardest decisions I think anyone can make. Um, She decided to put her mother in hospice care. And I was texting her one day. I called her. She didn't pick up. I texted her, and I said, hey, how's how's it going? How's your mom doing? Uh, Let me know when I can come by for a visit. And she said, well, uh, mom's oxygen levels are dropping, so you better come soon. So I got in the car. I rushed to the hospital. We said some prayers around the bed, and then about 15 minutes later, uh, her mom died in front of us. She passed from this life into the next. And I looked at my friend, and <clears throat> she said to me through tears, this has been the most amazing day. She said, my mom woke up this morning and said, today's the day. I'm leaving today. And then they had seven wonderful hours 
for they called everyone who needed to be called, and they said everything that needed to be said. And my friend said, you know, my, my mother and I are very close, and I love her very dearly, but she was not always the easiest person. She had a bit of an edge. My friend said, not today. Today she was more gracious, more open-hearted, more generous than I have ever seen before. She talked about what a huge gift it was to have that day together. <clears throat> so my friend and her mother, they faced a thing none of us want to face, which is the reality of our mortality, our death. And in so doing, they found life. They found hope. They found peace, really in a way for this friend that she never had with her mother before. So I don't know this morning what you are avoiding, what pain you'd rather forget, what fear you'd rather not look at. I don't know where it is that you think God isn't and couldn't possibly be, but I'd be willing to bet that that's just the place where God is working. That's where He's doing something. That's where you're going to find Him. Amen.